Appreciate it. Thanks for that welcome. Come on, shout another praise to the Lord. Thank you. Glory to God. Aren't you glad you're a believer? Boy, we're in a good place tonight, a nice warm place tonight. That's important, I think. Praise God. I'm grateful to God for the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe he's come tonight to do some things, as Pastor Dustin's already mentioned, to bring real revelation knowledge, ideas from the Spirit of God. You know, one word from God really can change your life forever. One concept, one thing that comes alive. And uh, we're going to take some time to go through a few things tonight that I believe will just have a, a lasting impact. Praise God. Are you glad you've come tonight? We set our expectations up. We set it high. Not an expectation for me to show out, but an expectation for the Spirit of God to do what He does. And He does things on the deepest level, doesn't He? He's ready to pry things out, plant things in, tear things down, and build things up. So that covers a lot of ground, man. Whatever you need, to, if you've got some wrong stuff, he wants to pry it out and tear it down. I know that's not an exciting concept. <laughs> kind of like getting a wisdom tooth pulled. It's, it's a bummer while it happens, but it's great when it's over. <laughs> Where'd that come from? <laughs> anyway, though. It's... it's must be Saturday night. Glory to God. I think you ought to shout another praise to the Lord. Come on, Jesus. Hallelujah. Say it out loud. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. So go ahead and rejoice again. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. So go ahead and be seated. Thank you, Lord Jesus. As has been mentioned, I've been coming a long time, as a lot of you already know, and if you don't know that, it's really not important, but I have. And uh, I appreciate the relationship I have and I've had with this ministry for a long time. I really admire what happens around here. Every time I see uh, the progress that's made, the new things that are going on, the vision that's continuing to unwrap and unfold, it just, it just reminds me what an excellent, high-quality ministry and leadership is a part of what God has designed here. And uh, man, I'm glad to, to be able to come and minister to you in the middle of such an exciting ministry. I, I love Mac and Lynn, and they know it. I don't tell them to their face much, but... Uh, I mention it when they're not here, because <laughs> they're not here, and I'm here. I love these guys, and uh, love what God has this ministry doing, not just here, but all over the world, man. The impact is phenomenal. But I've really come to just share some simple things with you tonight, and uh, I'm not going to take long, but I'm going to take long enough. How's that? You didn't drive across town from wherever you came from so we could rush through this, did you? <laughs> God bless you for saying that. That was the right answer. Thank you for that. An angel of God showed up and said something to Mary in describing what was about to happen and how God wanted to unwrap and unfold things in her and through her in the birth of Jesus. But he made this statement, Gabriel said in Luke chapter 1 verse 37, he said, For with God nothing shall be impossible. With God nothing shall be impossible. With God, said out loud, with God, with God. Nothing, nothing shall be impossible. That's such a powerful concept that with God, not without him obviously, but with God, nothing shall be impossible. When you're with God, nothing shall be impossible. 
You, do, you look at these words, and guys like me enjoy studying this kind of stuff. And this word for nothing is no rhema from God. With God, no rhema. Now, if you've studied this at all, you know what rhema is all about. It is a spoken word from God. It is that Greek word for that's translated word many times, but it is a spoken word from God. No spoken word from God shall be impossible. Even that idea of impossible is to be without power. No spoken word from God shall be without power. I want to emphasize that. I mean, we, we know these things. But I want this to just drop on the inside of you that God speaks and releases power. His written word is designed not to stay written only. It is designed to be spoken. Words, our words, like God in this way, are not designed only or merely to describe things. But they are to release things. They are not to describe it, but to define it and create it. God spoke. You know how Genesis goes. God spoke and things happened, man. God, God created with a spoken word. With God, nothing that God has said to you is without power. Real power. Dynamo power. Dynamic power. Power that could be described, and it, that word for power, dunamis, would describe hurricane force wind or a force of nature like a tornado that is is undeniably one of the most powerful things in nature. It can also describe the advancement of a mighty army. No word from God is without what it takes to advance something. How many of you could use some things being advanced in your life? We're in the process, every one of us, if we're paying attention to God and paying attention to His Word, and my goodness, you're a Saturday night Christian, so you're paying attention. <laughs> if we're paying attention, we understand that God is advancing or wants to advance things in our life. He wants to advance our families, our households, our relationships. He wants to advance our health, our mental capacities, our life. He wants to advance things. And he's always in the business of unwrapping things in our life so that we are advancing. God's all about increase. He doesn't leave things as they are. He, he has them growing, doesn't he? Anything alive in God grows. But there is a reality about, about the word and about anything that God does or anything he has said is that every word from God comes with opposition. Not that God opposes his own word, that's not it, but anytime we hear or receive anything from God, there is going to be opposition to it. We, we live in a world, you know how it's gone? It is a world of conflict and it is a world where there is a clashing of kingdoms. There's Really just two kingdoms, isn't there? There's the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. That's it. Everything that goes on in the world is a reflection of one of those two kingdoms. And every time God speaks a word and gives you a word, there is going to be a clash between what God has said and what the kingdom of darkness wants to see happen with what God has said. Now look. This isn't to say that the kingdom of, God, kingdom of God is subject to the kingdom of darkness in any way, shape, or form. I mean, 
I, I know you wouldn't think I meant to say that, but I'm going to clarify it. I'm not saying that. The kingdom of darkness doesn't hold a candle to the kingdom of God. There's, there's nothing that can withstand the mighty force of Almighty God. Are you kidding? Nothing. Well, nothing but one thing. Now, this is, this is shocking, but we know this. We know that the mighty power, the, the power of resurrection, that is the greatest force there is that came right out of Jesus exploding out of the grave and releasing resurrection power to anyone who would receive it. Here's what we know can stop that resurrection power. It is the power of decision. And here's what I mean by that. All of this great power of God has no power in a person's life until they decide to make Jesus the Lord of their life. That's, that's sobering. Nothing can stop the power of God except your choice to refuse to receive the power of God. That's where the war really goes on, isn't it? It goes on in our will or in our power of choice. It goes on in our head. And as a result, Satan has found that he can gain access to a person's life by weaseling his way into their mind. That's what he did in the beginning in the garden. You know that. I mean, you're in a church that teaches these things a lot. But I'm just going to remind you of a few of these things. Because in the Garden of Eden is where things shifted big time. God had created man, but it was there in the Garden of Eden, the greatest place on the earth where Adam and Eve lived that the serpent came. Satan used this serpent to deceive Eve. Eve was deceived. Adam was not deceived. Adam made a choice. He made a choice to betray God and let go of what God had given to him. And the moment that he did... What God said would happen did happen when they betrayed God and they ate of the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they died. They didn't die physically, but there was a distance, a gulf created between them and God that changed things forever. Here's, here's a thought that I think from time to time that in heaven. Adam is going to have heavy security. <laughs> I know heaven's all about the love of Jesus, so I'm, I, I guess that's probably not true. But there are many of us that really have questions. And we would like a direct, straight-up, clear answer. What was the matter with you? What were you thinking? How crazy are you? Well, it was all about that woman. Yeah, well, there would have been another way to deal with this rather than betraying God. There would have been redemption. There would have been a way out. There would have been help for Eve to come out of that moment. You know there would have been. But we don't have that story because we have Adam. Changed everything, and you know the hostilities that have come because of that. What that leaves us with is a reality that in the middle of our life, on an ongoing basis, even right now, there is a clash of these kingdoms that we have to address and learn how to walk in the most successful and victorious way. The Apostle Paul said it this way. He said, we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. We're not ignorant of his games, of the tools that he uses, the mind games that he plays. 
And that's really what I want to talk to you about the next few minutes is mind games. Because the battle that we are really in between light and dark, between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness, really goes on in the, in the battleground of the mind. It's in the mind or in the soul that you find the mind, will, and emotions of your inner life. And that's really the dimension that Satan plays with also. And that's why it's absolutely vital as believers that we, we discover the power of God's word that has been sown and, and planted and infused literally into your inner man, into your spirit at the new birth, how to cause that to rise up and be the point of decision to dominate things in our life rather than allowing our emotions to dominate or our fear or something else that's going on. These mind games, and just keep in mind, nobody's exempt from these games. As a matter of fact, Jesus was even confronted by the devil with mind games. You remember when it happened? Jesus said, live for approximately 30 years. And he knew the Father all of that time, born of the Spirit of God, free from the dominion of sin. But he had never done a miracle. He didn't do any teachings. He wasn't a public figure in the sense that he would be. But he went to be baptized by John the Baptist. And when he came up out of that water, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit descended upon him and rested upon him. This is an amazing moment. It really deserves some attention. Because in a moment's time, when Jesus came up out of the waters of baptism, we have the Holy Spirit descend and we have the Father speaking right out of heaven. You are my beloved Son, he said, in whom I am well pleased. Glory to God. We've got the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in this same event. And it's all about what was taking place. There was a transition where Jesus was moving out of knowing the Father only where now he would begin to reveal the Father. That's really what his entire ministry was. He said, I don't do anything unless I hear the Father say it or unless I see the Father do it. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 tells us that he was the perfect expression or reflection of the Father. That's what he did. One of his disciples late in Jesus' ministry finally at one stage said, would you just show us the Father? Jesus talked about the Father all the time. Would you just show us the Father? And Jesus replied to him and simply said, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. See, what that helps us understand is this. Are you still here? Yes. What that helps us... You got so quiet. I guess it's because I'm doing all the talking. But... Uh, <laughs> What that tells us is anything that people believe about God that is not reflected in the life uh, and ministry of Jesus is a misunderstanding of the truth. If you don't see it in the life and ministry of Jesus, but somehow you think God thinks this way, some way, and yet it's not really reflected in Jesus, you need to reexamine what you believe about God. Because Jesus was the perfect and complete reflection of the fullness of God. There's no question about it. But here's what takes place when Jesus comes out of that water of baptism. And when the Holy Spirit lands and descends upon Jesus. Jesus had had the Holy Spirit. He's born of the Spirit just like you now are born of the Spirit. But something happened when the Holy Spirit came upon him just like something happens as the Holy Spirit has come upon you. He empowers you to do just what Jesus began to do, to be a reflection of some things to reveal the Father God. 
That's really what our life is designed to be about. It's, it's designed to be a reflection of Jesus, who is a reflection of our Heavenly Father. We are the living, breathing body of the anointing of God now, doing in the world right now what Jesus did then. Amen. Revealed the Father. That's a tall order. I mean, it's cool that we look at Jesus and say, man, that's what he did. But it's, it's something different when we understand, man, that's how God's looking at us right now. He sees us as his sons, his children. And just like Jesus was the only begotten son of God who became the firstborn from the dead, the firstborn among many brethren, we now are born of the same spirit, free from the dominion of sin, and we have received the same Holy Spirit upon us as he had upon him. Well, that's a good place to shout right there. Glory to God. Now, there's something about this Son of God and this idea of being born of His Spirit now. There's a covenant concept I want to remind you of. And that is this, that Jesus as the firstborn, there's something very powerful about being the firstborn. Throughout Scripture, you find that the firstborn son had privileges in the family that nobody else had. There's some places around the world that it's the same now. It wasn't true in my family. <laughs> I was the firstborn son in my family. <laughs> it didn't happen there. But scripturally, you understand, man, the firstborn son would get double the inheritance of anybody else in the family. They had, they had responsibilities that nobody else had. But they also had an inheritance that nobody else had. Jesus was the firstborn, but now here's what I want to point out and remind you of. When you make Jesus the Lord of your life, you enter into Christ, don't you? That's, that's what it means to be a Christian. You are in Christ. Christ is now in you. And you have entered into his covenant and position and place as a firstborn child. And in fact, you literally enter into the, the inheritance of the firstborn son. Because in Christ, it's not about gender. In Christ, now, in the earth, it is about gender. We get that. And by the way, there's two. This is the way God made it. It's not, it's not hard to understand. It's easy. It's all through the animal kingdom, two. And it's all through your kingdom. There's two. But in Christ, there are only sons who have entered by covenant into the covenant of sonship, but not just being a son, being a firstborn son. In the kingdom, there is no secondborn. We have all entered into the covenant of the firstborn. Glory to God. This is why the genealogies all ended with Christ. There was no more genealogies in all of Scripture. You don't go through all the... Now, if you're into genealogy, my wife is. It's a big deal, so I get it. So there are still genealogies. But in Scripture, the genealogy ends with Christ. What does that mean? That, that means you're in Christ. That's the last... All right, man, I could get off on that. That's the last genealogy that, that matters. When it comes to these things. Now don't get offended like your family doesn't matter. That was not the point. It's all about Jesus. And that's what we're talking about. And that we're in Christ. Man, that's big. That is big. That's liberating. But here's what the Holy Spirit does. As Jesus has come out of these waters of baptism. He leads him into a, a wilderness area. 
for intimate time of fellowship, of intimate time of revelation, intimate time of understanding. We don't have hardly any details as to what went on out in this wilderness, except we do know one confrontation or one several confrontations with the devil. And I want to point out some things in that confrontation. Are you still with me? Have we read from the Bible yet? We have. But I'm going to read some more. Luke's Gospel, chapter 4. And I'm going to take you through these verses about this event because there's some light that I want to point out to you that I believe is going to do something for you. In Luke chapter 4, verse 3, it says, The devil said to him, Jesus, If you are the Son of God... Wait a minute, look at that. If you are the Son of God. What did he hear the Father say? You are my beloved Son. He heard that come right out of heaven. First thing Satan wants to say is to confront that word spoken by the Father that you are my Son... He said, well, if you are, he'll challenge it. Did you really hear from God? What was really said to you? What do you think God wants you to do? Have you made that up yourself? He'll do everything possible to talk you out of it and give you some crazy idea so you can prove and that's what he does with Jesus. He said, if you're the son of God, command these stones to become bread. Command these stones to become bread. Sometimes people get funny ideas of what it takes to prove that they believe and trust and, and, uh, and that God would do something. They have faith. They want to do something crazy to prove they've got faith. There was a... Some friends of Vicky's and mine back many years ago now, we were, Vicky and I were still living in California at the time, and, and we had developed a friendship with this couple, and this wife, she wore hearing aids, and, and uh, she really, uh, of course, wanted to be healed and wanted to, her hearing, but um, she would never go for prayer and never really deal with it much in, in, in that way. One time we got in a conversation about this sort of thing. We, didn't, when, we weren't prying or anything, but it just the conversation went this way. And, and she opened up her thinking to us as to what she was really thinking as to why she was not healed. She said, what I know is going to have to happen is I'm going to have to be in a service somewhere and somebody pray for me and then I'm going to have to take my hearing aids out, throw them on the ground, and stomp them, then I'll be healed. Where do people get these ideas? <laughs> then I'll be healed. How many times have I prayed for somebody, laid hands on them, we declare God's word and minister by faith and all the things, and they say, well... Nothing's changed yet, but I know one day I will be healed. I know I will be healed. God is faithful. I know I will be healed. And I know that we're defeated. Because Scripture doesn't tell us that we will be healed. I know this sounds too technical for some people, but this is absolutely vital to understanding how faith functions. It isn't that one day I'll be saved. One day I'll be healed. One day I'll be helped. One day the Holy Spirit will be available to me. No, these are things that have come, been established, settled. This lady that I mentioned to you, she didn't have to do anything other than receive what Jesus has given and lay hold on it by faith and speak God's word. Didn't have to stomp down on her hearing aids. Since when are hearing aids the issue? Since when are glasses the issue? Since when is medicine the issue? Our faith is in Jesus. 
If glasses can't heal your eyes, they can't keep your eyes from being healed. Oh, I'm glad you're excited about all of this. Well, that's a, that's a detour, but I'm not going to take it back. Here's what Jesus said to this. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, every rhema of God. That's how Jesus replied to the devil. It is written. Say it out loud. It is written. written. You got to get accustomed to using this idea. You see, you don't deal with the devil just in your head successfully. Jesus said something. He didn't just think something. He said something. This is a real confrontation. When Satan comes, and he comes in a variety of ways, he or his demons, to mess with your head, play some game on you, it's time to pull out what the master did and remind yourself how this really goes. We're dealing with an enemy here, and the only thing that is our source of strength and power is God's word, that it is written And we live by what has been spoken, and I'm speaking it now in the name of Jesus. We live by the spoken word of God. That's how Jesus said we live. Hallelujah. Not by bread alone. Let me just point something out to you on this. Uh, This is a slight detour, but it just springs off of this in my mind. Our faith is in his word, right? We have to watch it that we keep our faith in his word. Now, I'm all for eating well, take a lot of supplements. Sometimes it seems like you take enough supplements, you really don't have any room for food. <laughs> Taking all these supplements now, you know, and all this stuff. And I'm good, that's good. I've, I've done this for years and stuff. But keep in mind, everyone, that Jesus healed in the Gospels was on the Mediterranean diet. I just want you to keep that in mind. It's not the food. It's not the... It's not the supplements alone. That's not where we put our faith. Our faith is in God's Word. That's where healing, recovery, restoration, sustaining... Power comes in. It is by the authority of his word. So man doesn't live by bread alone or Mediterranean diet alone or whatever the latest fad is. I mean, it just changes quite often. That's not saying you need to skip the dieting. You do whatever you need to do. I really am not here to talk to you about that. But Jesus said, we live. We have life according to what God has said. I know it's a reminder for you. But the devil went on, took Jesus up to a high mountain, showed him the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all authority I will give you and their glory for it has been delivered or that word could be translated betrayed as we were talking about earlier. It has been betrayed to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. That's a... That's an amazing moment because we understand this, and Satan would have understood this actually. Jesus had come to shift the authority that was in the earth. You remember that's what took place in the garden. The authority that God had given man in the earth over this whole earth, that authority had been given to Adam and Eve. That's what was betrayed into the hands of the devil. And this is a temptation to Jesus because Jesus has come to get that authority back. Are you following me? Satan knew that the attack was on. The moment that the father spoke and said, 
You are my beloved son. Now there was no question who God had spoken of in Genesis 3.15 when he said, one will come and crush your head. He told the devil that. Now, there's no question who this is. All through history prior to this, Satan didn't know who the Messiah was. Anybody that God used was a potential. Right from the beginning with Abel. God received Abel's offering and not Cain's. Abel had to be killed. He could be the one. And it went on from there. But now, Satan knows exactly who the enemy is. And it's Jesus himself. All focus of darkness was on Jesus at this point. Are you with me? So look at how Jesus replies to this. Again, he says it. He answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan. I think you ought to practice that yourself right now. Get behind me, Satan. Let's, let's say it again together. Get behind me, Satan. One more time. Get behind me, Satan. It just feels better and better the more you say it. Whatever the devil's up to, whatever he's tried to convince us of, get behind me, Satan. Whatever kind of pain or future he's tried to paint in your head as to the way things are going or going to go. Get behind me, Satan. All authority has been given to, to me, Satan said, and I'll give it to you. Now, look, we know Satan's a liar. So there's no guarantee that that really would have happened anyway. But that wasn't even a consideration. I mean, it's silly to even bring it up. Jesus is never going to bow. And neither are you. Say it, I'm not bowing. I'm not bowing. See, this is what the devil tries to do is tell you, you're going to bow or you're going to burn. That's what he told Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in that fiery furnace situation. You either bow to the, to the statue of to worship, or you're going to burn. They said, well, O king, we're not going to bow, and we're not going to burn. That didn't seem like an option. But they had taken that position, we don't bow. So the king threw them in the fiery furnace. You remember that? That's one of the greatest stories you've ever read. If you hadn't read it, you need to. It's a big one. Because that king looked into the fire. You remember what he saw? He didn't see three men walking around in that fire. He saw four. Glory to God. One of the greatest messages I've ever heard preached was by Oral Roberts, the fourth man in the fiery furnace. It's all about this and much, much more. It's amazing. The fourth man, Jesus, was in the fiery furnace with these three Hebrew children. Non-compromise. When Satan comes at you, there's something on the inside of you that God has given you the equipment to refuse to compromise. Satan does his best to paint a picture in your head how bad it's going to be, how much pain you're going to have, or how dark it can get, or how much trouble it's going to cause, or how broke you can get, and how bad that's going to look, and on and on. And man, your brain just runs with this as long as you'll let it. You start having all kinds of imaginations and seeing things, envisioning how bad it really will be. These are the mind games that Satan plays. And the truth is, the more we let our imagination run with these things, the more fear sets in and the less we stand in faith and the more we stand in fear. See, Satan does everything to push us. Just push us. God doesn't push. He leads. There's a big difference. If you're feeling pushed, 
You need, to, you need to get a real clear picture as to what's actually going on. You're being pushed into something. The Holy Spirit leads. Say, well, I need him to lead fast. Well, he's capable of leading fast. But sometimes fast is not really the idea that you actually need. Anyway, you get it. He said, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem and he set him on the pinnacle and he said to him, if you are the son of God, there's that if again, same tactic. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. Now look at this. We've got the devil quoting a scripture. For it is written. That's amazing. You know, not every time a scripture gets thrown at you does it mean to be used in the way it's being used. Sometimes people, and certainly here the devil, uses a scripture in a way it was never intended or designed to be used. You know if it's coming out of the mouth of the devil. Something wrong here somewhere inside of what he's saying. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. Now Satan did leave off a few words from that scripture. You know he's a master at twisting things. He's twisting an idea to be manipulated and used in a different way in order to manipulate people and try to manipulate Jesus. Of course, Jesus is not going to get manipulated. You know that. But this was a for real temptation. This was no game being played. Satan goes on to continue his quote, verse 11, and says, In their hands... They shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered and said to him. He said something again. It has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. What Satan was doing was something that would push Jesus and try to push God into doing something and not lead Jesus, like the Holy Spirit would. And that's a, t that's a key concept to know that you are not going to go Satan's way. You're going to go God's way and say it has been say You shall not tempt. I am not going down that stupid road. I don't have anything more to prove except that I know Jesus and love him. Now, coming to a conclusion... And I've got so much going now, I can't really wrap this up just right. But I want to give you some keys to really dealing with Satan that Proverbs gives us. Solomon gives us some very clear statements throughout Proverbs, but I want to focus on chapter 4 and verse 20, where he says, My son, give attention to my words, all right? Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those that find them and health to all their flesh. Verse 23, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Let me read that to you from the Passion Translation. He said, so above all, say above all. This is a major concept that I want to land on and I want to punctuate everything with that we've looked at tonight. He said, above all, guard the affections of your heart. Keep in mind your heart includes your mind, your will, your emotions. It's the soulish side of your inner life. In this statement it is. He said, pay attention to the welfare of your innermost being." For from there flow the wellsprings of life. He says, pay attention to what you're paying attention to. You know, if you're spending more time collecting news on the latest COVID 
issues or the latest Democrat-Republican fight or the latest economic collapse, wherever it is in the world at this stage, or whatever it is has your attention. And you're spending more time on that than you are paying attention to what God has for you in your life, then your discouragement is self-inflicted. You don't even need the devil's help to get you depressed. You found a way to just depress yourself. No, you got to give attention to what you're giving attention to. Guard your heart. Guard your head. Guard your mind. See the games for what they are and refuse to allow yourself to let strongholds in your soul remain. The Bible tells us we can tear down strongholds. That's the games Satan plays on people using past issues even or events in their life or failures that they've seen or experienced. Satan will use those to try to paint pictures as to how the future is going to look. And instead of allowing those strongholds to remain, we guard our heart, tear down those strongholds, see those things for what they are, and refuse to allow them to remain. We take authority over it in the name of Jesus. You've been given this authority. You are a child of the Most High God. So in... In the midst of these strategies of an enemy, you remind yourself simply to put it the way it is. Get behind me, Satan, in the name of Jesus. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Glory to God. So guard your heart. That's what Satan really is after. He's after your head, your heart, your mindset. And he uses various games in order to get it done. Well, we're not going to fall prey to his games. Jesus gave us an example how not to. And we're just going to use his example. It is written, devil. Get behind me, Satan. I live by the word of God. I'm not going to tempt the Lord. I'm, going to, I'm submitted to him, not pushing, trying to push him. But I'm being led by him. And we just learn how to respond to these kind of things and do it in faith and do it consistently. And if you stumble and fall, you just get up and dust off and repent and go back at it, doing it right in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Are you glad you came tonight? Yes. I want you to stand with me, and I want us to pray, lay hold on this. Because here's what happens when the anointing is flowing and the presence of God comes. There's healing in the house. There's restoration for the soul. There's bodies that can be healed. And here's what I find. Some of the greatest miracles and anointing I've ever seen happened in the kind of anointing we've just been walking in in declaring and teaching and ministering the Word, but the Holy Spirit is distributing things. He's distributing healings and deliverance and help, and we receive it. Are you a receiver? Yes. Say it out loud. I am a receiver. receiver. So lift your hands before God right now. Father, we do receive tonight. We receive your anointing. We receive your correction, your direction, your instruction. We receive your presence that brings light and life and healing and brings rejoicing of heart in the name of Jesus. Father, all over this audience, people are receiving. Your presence is here. Healing in their bodies, healing in their soul, healing in their household. Things are being resolved in a moment's time by the power and the presence of the Spirit of God. Doesn't take long for God to do supernatural things. And we receive it. Say it out loud. I do receive in the name of Jesus. Now, Satan, get behind me. Glory to God. That feels good, doesn't it? Now, Satan, say it out loud. Now, Satan, get behind me. Something about the action even helps. Now, Satan, get behind me. Glory to God. Can you say amen? Thank you, Jesus. Before I'm, I'm uh, 
I finish and get off the platform, let me mention something to you. As always, we've brought some various materials from our ministry, and I want to point out a couple of them to you that are available to you. I've had them here before, but uh, I just feel like this is the direction to bring your attention. There's a book my wife wrote entitled, Help, It's Dangerous Out Here. Some of you may have already read it. Anybody already read this? A number of you have. Praise the Lord. God bless you. This is one of the most powerful things our ministry's ever produced. And it is a compilation of events and times, stories, in our life largely, but in various people's lives, where God brought divine intervention and turned something completely around and provided divine, supernatural protection when it didn't look like there was a, going to be an answer or any help. There are some amazing events that we've experienced, and Vicki described them, but also teaches how to stand in faith to receive this supernatural protection in your own life. It is just an amazing page-turner type book. It is very exciting to read. And, um, and I just encourage you to go by the table and pick one up for yourself if you don't have it. Or you can go to our website, DennisBurkMinistries.org. You can download it there and uh, let it be a blessing to you. There's also a series of messages that I've taught entitled, How to Meditate in God's Word. I think one of the greatest keys that I've ever discovered in growing up in my own life, I, I discovered early on as a, as a believer and as a minister how to meditate in God's Word and uh, have taught this for many years, but this particular uh, series of three messages I taught at the Kenneth Copeland Bible School, and we captured things and we've made it available. Now these are CDs, that's available to you. These are also downloadable at our website uh, if you wanna go there and take advantage of it that way and let it bless you, glory to God. You know what it takes, it takes feeding on God's word and continuing a steady diet of in uh, intake so there is increase in Jesus' name. Amen.